I'm Liz Faubless and this is Currents. Graduation ceremonies are around the corner, but at a couple of Catholic colleges, there's controversy over commencement speakers. Plus, if you're still single, is it time to panic? I am single. Um, a lot of my friends are getting married. There's a little panic there, you know, um, society pressures and everything. And a blind activist wants out of his home country. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Anna Maria College, located in Paxton, Massachusetts, and Mercy College of Toledo, Ohio, have more than just their Catholic faith in common. In the last two months, they have issued separate invitations asking prominent guests to speak at their commencement ceremonies, only to later disinvite them after bishops in their respective dioceses raised concerns, pointing out that some of the honorees' public stances were contrary to church teachings. Now, other Catholic institutions of higher learning, including Boston College Law School, the University of Notre Dame, and St. Joseph College in Connecticut are facing similar scrutiny. The Cardinal Newman Society, established in 1993 as an advocate of Catholic higher education, has flagged those as well as six other schools they say run the risk of featuring keynote speakers considered public opponents of Catholic teaching. And even more may be announced in the coming weeks. Well, earlier I spoke with Patrick Riley, the society's president, to learn how they determine if a Catholic college or university is crossing the line. Patrick, can you quickly describe for our viewers the role of the Cardinal Newman Society? Uh, yes, well, our mission is to help strengthen and renew Catholic identity in Catholic higher education, which has declined significantly over the last few decades. Uh, so we report on developments at Catholic colleges, but we also work directly with the colleges on strengthening their Catholic identity. Okay, now the Cardinal Newman Society has found at least 11 scandalous speakers and honorees at Catholic colleges, and you suggest more may be on the way. Can you describe a little bit what you mean by scandalous? Uh, yeah, we try to use, uh, we follow the bishop's guidelines issued in 2004 that Catholic institutions should not honor any individual who publicly uh, has opposed fundamental Catholic teachings. Uh, so, you know, there are two aspects of that. Number one, it has to be public and very clear that they're opposing the church on these issues. And secondly, the issues that, that they may be in conflict with are things that are not just a matter of prudential judgment, but are, are areas where it's very clear that they're uh, opposing uh, key teachings on life and marriage and other issues like that. Now, Patrick, when guests like, say, President Barack Obama are invited to speak, clearly a very high-profile, prominent guest speaker that can inspire a graduating class just by virtue of achieving the position he's in against tremendous odds. When they're not considered because of their views, is there a chance that a school might be disregarding the greater good of having that speaker? No, I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, uh, Catholic institutions are held to a, a standard, and, and the first standard ought to be Catholic teaching. Um, and when they hold up someone for honor, uh, they ought to be deliberately trying to choose people who are honorable not just according to uh, normal secular standards, but also according to you know, what the church would consider to be honorable in a moral sense. Now, St. Joseph College made your list in Connecticut because they were going to honor Governor Dan Malloy, who right. is a supporter of abortion rights and same-sex marriage, with an honorary degree. Now, he was also applauded when he signed a law repealing Connecticut's Death Penalty Act. Mm -hmm. So is that now overshadowed? Uh, well, I don't think that particular incident is, is overshadowed. I think what he did was wonderful and ought to be applauded uh, by the church and by the college. Now, the question is whether he should be selected for an honorary degree and as the commencement speaker, and I would say absolutely not. I mean, his positions on marriage, same-sex marriage, and on abortion rights are directly opposed to what the church is trying to do. These are very, very serious moral issues. So it's not really a matter of, of judging him in total and saying that there's something wrong uh, with him, although there's clearly something wrong with his moral positions. Mm -hmm. It's a question of whether a Catholic institution ought to be deliberately choosing that individual or ought to be looking for someone who is more consistent with their teachings. Okay, Patrick, I want to talk about the more high-profile issues of, of the last couple of months. We had Victoria Reggie Kennedy, 
widow of Senator Edward Kennedy. She was disinvited by Anna Maria College because her views on some issues were contrary to the church. We also had Mercy College of Ohio rescinding an invite to lawmaker Bob Hagan, citing his views on abortion. Now, Kennedy says of Youngstown Bishop Robert McManus, who actually urged the retraction, I just want to read you something really quickly here. He has not consulted with my pastor to learn more about me or my faith, yet by objecting to my appearance at Anna Maria College, he has made a judgment about my worthiness as a Catholic. This is a sad day for me and an even sadder one for the church I love. Any thoughts or concerns about this particular statement? Well, I think she misunderstands what's happening here. I mean, the judgment, again, is made based on her public opposition to Catholic teachings, and that's been very clear in things that she's written and said in the past. Um, now, if, if she were being denied communion, that would be a matter of a judgment about her personal uh, spirituality, her personal relationship with, with God and with the Church, and that would be something that is much more of a pastoral consideration. But the question here is not uh, a matter of trying to uh, publicly in any way uh, criticize the individuals who are being disinvited. The, the question is whether the institutions, as Catholic institutions, are making the right choice. And the sad thing is when an institution announces something like this without consulting the bishop in the first place, uh, they put someone like uh, M Mrs. Kennedy in that, in that embarrassing position, which really was unfair to her as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they should not have invited her in the first place. Patrick, really quickly, Anna Maria says that as a small Catholic college that relies heavily on the goodwill of its relationship with the bishop and the larger Catholic community, its options are limited. I just want to ask really quickly what you think of this. How much of a role does the bottom line play in choosing who can or cannot speak? Well, you know, the bottom line meaning what, funding for the institution? Yes, funding for the um, institution. Oh, I think it plays a big role very often. That's, that's the nature of any sort of nonprofit organization that relies on donations. Uh, they want uh, publicity. Sometimes they will actually select commencement speakers who are likely to make major gifts to the institution. And, and frankly, I think that's all fine. Those are practical considerations, but they should never trump the, the, the mission of the institution, which is to be a Catholic educational uh, college or university and that upholds Catholic teachings. All right, Patrick, fair enough. And that is the last word. Thank you so much for joining us today, shedding some light on, on some of these issues. We really Thank appreciate you. it. You're very welcome. Now, Cardinal Newman's website does say that the 11 cases they have identified so far may be good news. According to their research, they have seen a marked decline in Catholic college commencement scandals from 24 colleges in 2006 to 14 last year. Well, stay tuned. The day's top headlines coming up next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Today is a national day of prayer in the U.S. In a proclamation issued earlier this week, President Obama called for prayers for all U.S. citizens, particularly the most needy. The president paid tribute to men and women of the armed forces. He also noted the freedom Americans enjoy to practice or not to practice faith as they see fit. Now the day did not come without some controversy. The American Humanist Association also spearheaded a national day of reason. The goal, well, to celebrate celebrate just that, reason, which the sponsors say is a concept that, quote, all Americans can support. Last month, an appeals court overturned a lower court ruling that declared the National Day of Prayer unconstitutional. World-renowned evangelist Billy Graham has announced his support for a marriage amendment in his home state of North Carolina. The measure would affirm marriage in the state as between a man and a woman. In a statement on his website, Graham says he believes marriage and the home are the foundations of society and must be protected. He's taking out full-page ads in 14 newspapers across the state, encouraging residents of the state to vote for the marriage amendment next Tuesday. Graham says he never thought we would have to debate the definition of marriage. For the second time in one month, police have removed Occupy protesters from a building owned by the Archdiocese of San Francisco. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, several hundred protesters entered the building on Tuesday, intent on turning it into a homeless shelter. 
26 people were arrested. Now, a month ago, a similar incident occurred at the same location. Church officials said protesters caused $25,000 in damages. A spokesman for the archdiocese said the church planned to lease the building and use the money to help low-income students pay tuition. Irish Cardinal Sean Brady says he will not resign, despite calls for him to step down following a news report of his role in a sex abuse inquiry. In an interview with Irish broadcaster RTE, Cardinal Brady says that a BBC program was seriously misleading and untrue, that's a quote, when they reported that he led the 1975 inquiry of a priest accused of abusing a minor. Brady says that he was only a note taker during an interview with an alleged abuse victim. The Cardinal says that the BBC program the world set out to deliberately exaggerate and misrepresent his role in the investigation and handling of the alleged abuse. Brady also says he was shocked, appalled, and outraged to learn that the priest in question had gone on to commit even further abuse. The Pope pays a visit to a hospital to celebrate a big milestone. Rome Reports has that story. Benedict XVI went to the Gemelli Hospital Thursday morning, but not because of a medical condition. He visited the local Italian hospital to congratulate teachers, students and staff, since this year the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery celebrates its 50th anniversary. The Pope talked about his time as a university professor by explaining why the relationship between reason and faith is so critical. Cari amici, lasciatevi sempre guidare dalla sapienza che viene dall'alto, da un sapere illuminato dalla fede, ricordando che la sapienza esige la passione e la fatica della ricerca. The Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, named Agostino Gemelli, is part of the University of the Sacred Heart, which is a major Italian university. And so Benedict XVI talked about what makes a Catholic university so special. Proprio questa coniugazione di ricerca scientifica e servizio incondizionato alla vita delinea la fisionomia cattolica della Facoltà di Medicina e Chirurgia Agostino Gemelli perché la prospettiva della fede è interiore, non sovrapposta né giusta posta alla ricerca acuta e tenace del sapere. The rector of the university gave the Pope two beautiful feathers, and to say farewell, the university's choir sang to the Pope. Gemelli Hospital played a big part in the history of the papacy. Pope John Paul II was given emergency surgery there in 1981 after the failed assassination attempt against him in St. Peter's Square. And some big names were honored last night in Manhattan for giving back. The Pontifical Mission Societies hosted its inaugural awards dinner. The Pontifical Mission Societies is uh, responsible for keeping the church going. That's clinics, orphanages, chapels, convents, seminaries in 1150 dioceses around the world. Well, we're having the inaugural World Mission Dinner to support the Pontifical Mission Societies. That's the Pope's own missionary corps. People having fun, but giving money and their support and their prayers. It's a huge undertaking, but Americans have been very generous with the missions, and that's what we're doing again, kicking that off again this evening. We don't apologize for the fact that we want to raise some money to help the poorest of the world, spiritually poor who have never heard the saving name of Jesus Christ, and also the materially poor. But we also want to increase awareness, and a, uh, an event like this will do that. It is my joy, my honor, to invite Mary Higgins Clark to receive the insignia of the Pontifical Mission Societies, identifying her as a Pontifical Ambassador for Mission. Today it's becoming uh, more and more problematic to be a witness to your faith in the public square. These are three very public people uh, in the area of arts, uh, TV, the economy, uh, Wall Street, if you like, and Cardinal McCarrick in the church. And they're never shy about talking about the importance of their faith in Jesus Christ, and we're honoring them for it tonight. It was a chance for me to give some witness and testimony in my own life where uh, Jesus helped save me. I was a hopeless alcohol and drug abuser, and it worked. I am overwhelmed. I am deeply honored, very deeply honored. 
and certainly I share it with illustrious people. Well, they planted us as a mission societies in the heart of Manhattan. This is what you do. They want to give to people less well off than themselves. They want to reach out. We're saying to them, give it to us. And if that, those funds can go to the missions, then the missions are very happy. There were so many familiar faces there. Congratulations and a round of applause for all the work that they do. Don't go anywhere. There's more Currents Ahead. Coming up, single or married, what's your calling? I am single. <laughs> I panic sometimes. But um, I'm confident, like, God has a plan for my life. Welcome back. Well, if you read your local paper, you'll soon begin seeing one section in particular becoming a little heftier in the coming months. That would be the one that includes wedding announcements. As the temperature rises here in the U.S. during the spring and summer months, so too do the number of weddings taking place. And it's all so special until some consider this. What happens when your friends are tying the knot, but you are not? Is it time to panic if you have not yet found that special person? Well, Catholic singles from the city and beyond got some food for thought earlier this week at a Theology on Tap in Manhattan. And there may be some in this room tonight that actually stay single for the rest of their lives. And the first thought is, yikes. There is a bit of a dilemma with people not getting married, which creates this, you know, plethora of single people out there. It begs the question, you know, are we called to the married life? Are we called to the religious life? Or can we be called to the single life? There are individuals who, who really feel that they're meant to be single and not to be married or to be a religious. Uh, but I think most people that are single at a certain stage in life really are not single by choice yet, as much as circumstance. As we go through some of the challenges of being single, and perhaps being single with the desire to be married and not finding the right person, there can be a lot of doubt of God and even anger. But what we have to always remember is God will only and always work for what leads to my happiness. Our Lord never promised us it would be easy, but he did promise us that if we would trust him, and if we would pray, and if we'd stay close to him, he'd give us the grace to take the steps we needed to take. And I think that young people find, and young adults find in today's society, that it isn't easy. But if they will trust our Lord, he will give them the grace to begin to take their steps. This is not the era of our parents where, you know, it was very easy for people to find, you know, husbands and wives because they all, there was a culture of the same values, the same Catholic moral teachings. But now we're li we live in a very secular world, so we're having more and more numbers of single people out there because it's really tough to find, you know, um, the right person. I am single. <laughs> I panic sometimes. But, um... I'm confident, like, God has a plan for my life, so I want to do whatever he has for me in the right time, so I'm good. It's difficult sometimes when I read passages in the Bible where God said to Adam, um, it's not good for a man to be alone, and then he provided him Eve. So for me being single, I look at that and I pray to God and I say, I'm single, where's my Eve? But I just have to be patient. I am single. Um, a lot of my friends are getting married. There's a little panic there, you know, um, society pressures and everything. But, you know, I trust that, that God has a plan for me and I know it'll show itself in due time. I think being single is a cross in some sense because it's not accepted in society as a whole. But there's a lot of great things a single person can do because they have the time to devote to other things. We learn to trust God and his plan. And that requires that we pray and we pray well that you're very secure in who you are. And you only be secure in who you are if you're actually insecure in who God made you to be. And a lot of positive attitudes there, and that's very important. Stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. When we return, a Chinese activist is looking for refuge in the U.S.
Secretary of State Hillary Clinton may be in China for economic talks, but her trip has taken a much different turn. That's because human rights activist Chen Guancheng, who escaped house arrest last week, sought refuge at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Now, Chen, who was blind, has spoken out against alleged human rights abuses in China. Abuses include forced abortions and sterilization, which are used as a means of enforcing the country's one-child-per-family policy. Chen left the U.S. Embassy yesterday, but there are differing accounts as to the reasons why. And as we hear from CNN, Stan Grant, Chen now wants to leave China altogether. It's a small voice on the end of a phone line, but with an explosive story to tell. 3 a.m. Thursday in Beijing, and Chen Guangcheng answers our call. From his hospital bed, the blind dissident the world wants to hear from, now tells CNN he fears for his life. He says he wants to get out of China and is appealing to President Obama himself. I would like to say to him, please do everything you can to get our whole family out, he pleads. He wants to go to the United States, a country that just hours earlier drove him to a Chinese hospital and he says left him there. Chen had been holed up for six days in the U.S. Embassy. He'd sought refuge there after fleeing 18 months of what he called brutal house arrest. After backroom negotiations, the U.S. and China seemed to have struck a deal. Chen could leave freely and safely. A smiling Chen Guangcheng is seen here leaving the embassy for treatment at the hospital. But between leaving the U.S. grounds and speaking to us, everything changed. I'm very disappointed with the U.S. government, he says. Chen now claims he was urged to leave and then deserted. The embassy kept lobbying me to leave, he says, and promised to be with me at the hospital. But this afternoon, soon after we got here, they were all gone. Inside the embassy walls, Chen says he was cut off from the outside world and now doesn't think he knew enough to make such a critical decision. At the time, I didn't have a lot of information, he says. I wasn't allowed to call my friends from inside the embassy. I couldn't keep up with the news, so I didn't know a lot of what was happening. What was happening, he now says, was that his family back in their village was being terrorized. After discovering Chen had escaped, he says police turned on his wife. She was tied to a chair by police for two days, he tells us. Then they carried thick sticks to our house, threatening to beat her to death. If he didn't leave the embassy, Chen said, his wife was told she would pay the price. They said they would send her back to Shandong and people there would beat her, he says. Each time CNN has tried to independently confirm these claims, we've been physically ejected from Chen's village by guards. This day, Chen passed the phone to his wife, Yuan Weijing. Like her husband, she says there is no future for them here. After seeing the reality, we both want to leave this place with our kids as soon as possible. It is very dangerous for us. All of this has played out with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in Beijing for trade talks, overshadowed now by the Chen drama. Secretary Clinton saying, quote, Chen has a number of understandings with the Chinese government about his future, including the opportunity to pursue higher education in a safe environment. U.S. officials insist they did not fail Chen. All procedures were followed. And we have very strict protocols on how we handle these things, and I saw on at least three occasions uh, our wonderful ambassador here, Ambassador Locke, ask him specifically, as we are required to do, with witnesses around, uh, Mr. Chen, uh, are you ready to leave the embassy voluntarily? And each time he said, uh, Zo, which means let's do it, let's go. The U.S. maintains Chen always insisted that he wanted to stay in China. He didn't want to leave. He never sought political asylum. Officials also maintain that China never made known to them any threats, nor did officials speak to Chen about any physical or legal threats to his wife or children. The happy, excited Chen Guangcheng, who walked out of the embassy, is now a man afraid in his hospital room, his wife too scared to leave his side. Together they say it over and over. Please, get us out of here. We are in danger, Chen says. If you can talk to Hillary Clinton, I hope she can help my whole family leave China. A day that seemed to start as a new beginning for Chen Guangcheng and his family has now ended 
in an all too familiar state of fear. And that report from CNN's Stan Grant. According to UCA News, a Hong Kong church group has called on the head of the Chinese government-approved Catholic Patriotic Association to speak up for Chen and his family. According to UCA, the bishop who heads the association is also approved by the Vatican. Well, that is all for this edition of Currents. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also connect with us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Thank you for watching and have a good night. I'm Liz Faubless. Tonight on Currents, more violence in Nigeria. A Catholic Relief Services rep who's there gives us a sense of the situation. Plus, young people closer to home pitch in at a popular charity. Those stories and the rest of the day's headlines tonight on Currents.